speaker, Dr. Paula Gordon. She is a clinical professor in the Department of Radiology at UBC. She is the medical director of the Sadie Diamond Breast Program at BC Women's Hospital and is a founding member of the Canadian Society of Breast Imaging. She's passionate about saving women's lives and minimizing the impact of breast cancer by early detection. In recognition of her contributions to the field of breast imaging, she was awarded a Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal and was invested in the Order of British Columbia. In 2014, she was named one of Canada's 100 Most Powerful Women by the Women's Executive Network. I'd like to welcome Dr. Paula Gordon. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks for having me at the conference. Now we have to hope this wakes up. There we go. Good. So, I'm so pleased to be able to speak to you today. As you've heard, I'm Paula Gordon, and I'm a breast radiologist in Vancouver. I read mammograms and perform breast ultrasound, and I do image-guided biopsies, both ultrasound and stereotactic procedures. Um, here are my disclosures. I am here on a volunteer basis, and I have not received payment uh, for my work. So my objectives today are to talk to you about the basics of breast cancer and the risk factors for breast cancer. I want to explain how you can reduce your risk of getting breast cancer and describe methods of screening for breast cancer so if you do get it, it can be found as early as possible and then you'll be more eligible for the least aggressive options for treatment. I will explain why there are still varying recommendations on what age to start and how often to screen for breast cancer. And I'll explain to you the risks associated with having dense breasts and what women can do if they do have dense breasts. So let's start at the beginning. What is breast cancer? It's a disease where a group of cells loses the normal control. These abnormal cells grow usually into a lump, but not always, and they invade and damage the adjacent normal tissue. And they can spread to other parts of the body, nearby or distant lymph nodes, or more distantly to lung, bone, and brain. Breast cancer isn't always noticed by the presence of a lump. Sometimes it can attach to the overlying skin like you see here, so it looks puckered. Now, breast cancer is not life-threatening when it's confined to the breast. It's when it spreads to other parts of the body like the lungs here or the brain and the liver that I haven't shown you where it can kill. If breast cancer spreads to the bones, it can cause areas of weakness that can fracture easily, even without a fall or an injury. This picture is from a bone scan, and it shows a hot spot in the upper left femur, or the thigh bone. This picture shows a fracture in the femur. And if it spreads to the ribs or the spine, it's sometimes just coughing can cause a bone to fracture, either a vertebrae or a rib. Now, you've heard that one in eight statistic. But that's not across all ages. Breast cancer is very uncommon, but still occurs in the 20s and 30s. The incidence jumps dramatically in the 40s to 1 in 69 and keeps rising. It never drops. Women sometimes tell me, oh, I don't need a mammogram now that I'm 60s or 70s. But if a woman doesn't die of another disease, the, ins the risk of her getting breast cancer keeps climbing. There are factors that can increase a woman's risk of getting breast cancer, some of which are beyond our control and some of which are in our control. So this list are the, the factors you can't control. Genetic mutation, having chest wall radiation if you've had Hodgkin's disease, if you have dense breast tissue, you have a family history, or you've had a previous biopsy that showed atypical cells, if you started having periods early or had menopause late, or if you've not had children. Those are things that increase the risk of breast cancer. But here are... Uh, risk factors you can control. The use of estrogen, typically after menopause. Diet, fat and alcohol. Alcohol increases breast cancer risk. A lack of exercise increases risk. Smoking and an increased body weight. 
Most of, most of what I'll be talking today is about early detection, finding breast cancer as early as possible. But it would be even better if we could prevent it from happening altogether. And if people modified their habits around those controllable risk factors on the previous slide, especially if we started in childhood, it's thought that most breast cancers, 68%, could be prevented, even if we wait until middle age to clean up our acts. Perhaps as many half of all breast cancers could be prevented. Walking 30 minutes a day, can lower breast cancer risk by 20%. Each drink of alcohol per day, and that's beer, wine, or spirits, raises breast cancer risk by 10%. Here's a list showing again some of the things you can do to reduce your risk of getting breast cancer. Keep your weight in check, be physically active, avoid too much alcohol, breastfeed if possible, avoid birth control pills, particularly after age 35 or if you smoke, avoid postmenopausal hormones, Find out your family history, and if you are at risk, consider prescription medications that can reduce risk. But please remember, we are all at risk. The greatest factor for breast cancer is being female, and the second greatest factor is getting older. The fact is, 75% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. That's another myth that's out there. Women say, oh, I don't need to have a mammogram. I have family history. 75% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. So why do we screen for cancer? We want to save lives. We want to reduce mortality by finding and treating the disease earlier, but also we want to find it early so it can be treated less aggressively. When a woman has advanced disease at the time of diagnosis, if it's a big cancer or spread to the lymph nodes, she needs more aggressive surgery. When we find cancer earlier, a woman can avoid mastectomy and have a lumpectomy. She can avoid the armpit surgery called axillary dissection of a sentinel node biopsy. And nowadays, with genomic testing, many women can avoid chemotherapy. So there are different tests we use to screen for breast cancer to find it early. I'm going to focus on mammography and ultrasound. MRI is reserved for women at very high risk, typically women who have a breast cancer gene. But other exams, like breast self-examination or clinical breast exam, meaning done by a health care provider. And then there's some fancy tests that I'll talk about at the end. But I want to say right off the bat, thermography is completely invalidated. It is not good for screening for breast cancer. Here's some facts that everybody agrees on. Women are 20 to 40 less likely to die of breast cancer if they are invited to have a mammogram or actually have a mammogram. What does that mean, invited? And I have to explain that to you when we talk about randomized trials. That's well established. Another accepted fact, annual screening starting at age 40 saves the most lives. And this is recognized even by organizations that recommend starting later or screening less often. Even in British Columbia, women cannot come every year starting at 40 anymore. The current guidelines of what age to start screening and how often to screen are all over the map. Now, these conflicting guidelines did not arise because of alternative facts. They're all looking at the same facts, but they're applying different value judgments to those same facts. And you need to know what those judgment values are to stay aligned with your values and priorities. Media like to stir up passions, and this article was about the 2014 release of the 25-year follow-up of a screening trial done in Canada in the 1980s that was poorly designed and poorly executed and so came to the wrong conclusion. In fact, it was the only one of many randomized trials done throughout the world that did not show reduced deaths from breast cancer. I and many others internationally are painfully familiar with the details of that trial and have to stay on guard to respond. In fact, in 2002, the World Health Organization recommended that this Canadian trial not be used in making guidelines, but both the Canadian and American task forces still issue guidelines uh, based on that study. So we know from decades of research that mammograms save lives. You often hear that mammography is the only test that's been shown to reduce breast uh, deaths from breast cancer, and strictly speaking, that's true. But why is that? The only way that you can make that claim that a test reduces deaths is if you do a special experiment called a randomized control trial. In fact, we think that ultrasound will also have the same benefits and save lives for certain women in, a, in addition to mammography. And there is a randomized trial of ultrasound currently being done in Japan. 
the results, the preliminary results, suggest that it will also reduce mortality, but randomized trials take decades to mature. We know, for example, that MRI is used for high screening, as I told you, for women with genetic mutations, but MRI has never been tested in a randomized trial. So that raises the question, why do some tests get approved without a randomized trial and other tests not? Randomized trials of mammography have shown 15 to 20 percent mortality in women invited to be screened, but observational studies of women who actually do get screened show 40 to 49 percent fewer deaths. That's a big difference. That's because women in randomized trials don't always have the tests they're, they're invited to have. So if a woman's in a trial and she's assigned to the group that's supposed to have mammograms, but she doesn't have a mammogram, and let's say she gets a breast cancer and dies of it, her death is still counted in the mammogram group, even though she never had the mammogram. Observational studies track results by who actually had the test, not what part of the trial they were assigned to. And this explains why they show much better results than the randomized trials. This observational study compared women who had mammography to those that didn't, and they obtained data on almost 3 million women in Canada attending screening programs throughout the country, and they showed that women who attend mammograms are overall 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't have mammograms, and for women in the 40s, it's even better. They're 44% less likely to die. So I hope I'm getting the point across that mammograms work, and hopefully all the women in the room over 40 have had at least one. So this study looked at the data a bit differently. They looked at over 7,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer over a 10-year period in two of the hospitals in the Harvard system, and they looked at the women who died during that time. 609 of them died of breast cancer, and 903 died of other causes. Most of the deaths, 71%, occurred in the 20% of women who didn't have regular mammograms, and only 29% of the deaths occurred in women who were having regular screening. And of all the breast cancer deaths, only 13% occurred in women 70 years of age or older, but 50% occurred in women under the age of 50. 31% occurred in women initially diagnosed between 40 and 49. So this drives home the point that women should start screening at 40. Breast cancer is less common in the 40s, but when it does occur, it grows faster faster, so you want to detect it as early as possible. And this was final fact from this study, the median age of diagnosis of fatal cancers were 49 years, so another reason to start at 40. So this is what a mammogram looks like. Each breast is compressed twice, once from side to side and once from top to bottom, and a low-dose x-ray is taken in each position. And here's what the pictures look like. These are the top to bottom squish pictures on the left side, and the two on the right are the side-to-side -side squish pictures. And this lady has a cancer, this white thing in her breast, which is easy to see on her because her breast tissue is mainly fatty, and fat looks dark gray on a mammogram, so a white cancer jumps out and is really easy to see. We'll talk more about that later. So we know that mammograms can find cancers and save lives and find them early, and we know that annual screening starting at 40 saves the most lives, so why don't all provinces start at 40 and screen annually? Well, there are various organizations that don't support annual screening at 40, and some of them say that there are harms of screening and that these harms outweigh the benefits. They must be pretty significant harms to think that they outweigh the benefit of the saving lives. So let's look at some of those harms, and you tell me if you agree. Pain from compression. Yes, mammograms are uncomfortable, and they should be, but they shouldn't be excruciating. The reason we compress is to spread out the tissue so we can see better, and that includes seeing cancers better. The discomfort is for a few seconds. All modern mammography machines have a release switch, so the minute the picture is taken, the compression will release itself. In the old days, the technologists had to walk around back to where you were standing and unscrew the compression. That's not the case anymore. If a patient tells me that she doesn't want to have a mammogram because the last one was very painful, I tell her, and the technologist that I want the tech to stop compressing when the patient asks her to stop. I feel it's better to have a sub-perfect mammogram than no mammogram. And by the way, when you give the patient that control, most of the time they let the technologist compress as much as she wants. 
Now let's spend another couple of minutes talking about radiation. I know it's a concern for many people, but notice, not the task forces. They weren't concerned about radiation, but I want you to see why. There's radiation all around us all the time. Natural background radiation comes from the cosmos. The sun and stars send cosmic radiation to Earth, and the amount varies with how elevated you are on Earth. If you're at sea level, you get less, and if you live up in the mountains, you get more. We get radiation from the ground. Radioactive materials exist naturally in rock and soil. And the air, all air contains radon, which is the greatest background source. Even water has small amounts of dissolved radioactivity and all organic matter, both plant and animal, contains some radioactive carbon and potassium. So we're surrounded by radiation all the time. What's the radiation risk of having a mammogram? Well, it's primarily in women less than age 20, and we rarely do mammograms younger than 40. At age 40, the risk diminishes practically to nothing. Here's how much radiation, these are, and the measurement is in millisieverts, you get from a four-picture mammogram, you get 0.4 millisieverts. Well, just flying from Los Angeles to New York, or from New York to Europe, you get 0.08 millisieverts. The higher you are in altitude, the higher the dose of cosmic radiation you get. And this is a result of less shielding of the cosmic radiation by the atmosphere at higher levels. The dose from a mammogram is similar to what you get from natural radiation from living seven weeks on Earth. But if you live in Colorado or at higher elevation, you get the same radiation living for three to four weeks as you do from having a mammogram. To look a little deeper at the theoretical risk of radiation, my colleagues at Sunnybrook in Toronto calculated for a thousand women having mammograms from 50 to 69 every two years, the radiation would hypothetically, only hypothetically, cause 0.27 cancers and 0.04 deaths. But those mammograms would prevent five deaths, which is 125 times more than the lives lost, and save 105 years of life. So avoiding mammograms for a fear of radiation is not a winning bet. This graph is from an excellent website that I'll tell you more about, densebreast-info.org, and it shows the radiation from various tests that you're probably familiar with. The lowest radiation is from a bone density test or a chest x-ray. Mammogram is the third lowest. The blue vertical line on the right is the amount I'm allowed to get every year uh, from working in an x-ray department. And that's 12 times the dose of a, a mammogram, not that I'm suggesting uh, that you have 12 mammograms every year. False alarms are the biggest harm in the eyes of the task force. And here are the numbers. For every 1,000 women who have a screening mammogram, 93%, 930 of them, will get a letter saying your mammogram's normal. 7% or 70 of them will need additional tests. They get recalled. There's something there. It's probably not cancer. Maybe it's just a cyst. Maybe it's a blob of normal tissue. But we want to do some more tests. And the majority of those women might need one or two extra pictures or maybe an ultrasound. Of those 70, 11 of them will need a needle biopsy. That's a test that's done with local anesthetic. It's honestly not significantly more painful than having blood taken from your arm. And of those 11 women, four of them will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So the false alarms, the fear when women get recalled, I'm going to be one of those four out of 1,000. And there will be four, but at least we're finding cancer early. The task forces think that we should spare women the anxiety of a false alarm, and that's why they recommend starting screening later than 40 and screening less often, even though they know that more women will die. Do women think that false alarms are a reason to not recommend screening? Research in Pittsburgh studied this. They surveyed all women attending for routine screening over a five-month period, and 97% of those women said they would rather have regular screening, even if it meant having a false alarm. 86% said they'd be willing to be recalled more often for more tests, and 82% said they'd be willing to have a needle biopsy if it might increase the chances of detecting cancer earlier. So that's what you have to consider when you decide whether to have a mammogram. Remember, four of those 11 needle biopsies are going to show cancer, and hopefully most of them are early. Dr. Jian Lee in New York studied the effect of education for the public on anxiety and found that women felt empowered and more confident in the decision process and more willing to attend screening after having uh, a lecture educating them about screening. And hopefully that's how you're going to feel after this lecture. Another potential harm 
is overdiagnosis. And that's the possibility that we might find a cancer at screening that would never surface on its own. So there's really no need to know about them. It's probable, for example, that some get cancers grow so slowly that they might never become life-threatening. But we don't know yet how to figure out which those cancers are when we find them. So all cancers get treated. Or it's possible that a woman might die of something else before her cancer becomes life-threatening. For example, she might get heart disease, have a heart attack and die and the cancer didn't kill her, so maybe did she even need to know that she had breast cancer. Maybe she gets a different cancer, or maybe she's in a car accident and dies. So you could argue that, oh, those women didn't need to know about their cancers, but of course, most of us don't have a crystal ball, and if you knew that you were going to get killed in a car accident tomorrow, or die of a stroke six months from now, for heaven's sakes, don't have a mammogram, but I don't have a crystal ball. The panel that carries a lot of weight in Canada for screening guidelines is the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care. There are no breast cancer experts on that task force, no radiologist, no surgeon, no pathologist, no oncologist. But they're the ones that issue guidelines about breast cancer screening. They think that the harm of transient anxiety outweighs the benefits of early detection. They recommend no routine screening until age 50, and then only every two years, two to three years after that. And they say doctors should stop doing breast exams, and they say that women should not be encouraged to do breast self-examination. In other words, as this comic in a Vernon newspaper sh summed up about their recommendation, don't worry your pretty little heads about it. They weren't radi worried about radiation, but the reason they came to those recommendations is they exaggerated the harms and they underestimated the benefits, and they concluded that the harms outweigh the benefits. But the harm of transient anxiety, I hope you agree with me, does not equate with possible death in the absence of screening. When the U.S. task force made similar recommendations, doctors Helvey and Hendrick looked at the consequences for women turning 40 in the next 10 years, and they calculated that 100,000 more women would die in the U.S. of breast cancer by starting at 50 and only going every two years compared to annual starting at 40. It makes sense to screen women in their 40s, but women to 49 are not offered breast cancer screening in all provinces. We're really lucky in British Columbia that we can start at 40. Younger women have the most potential years of life to lose, and if they have cancer that's undiscovered until it's advanced, they're more likely to die. These are the women that are often caring for young children and aging parents, they're working and contributing to the economy, they're not expendable. So even the Canadian and U.S. task forces agree that screening annually starting at 40 would save the most lives, but they think it's more important to spare women the anxiety of a recall. In most provinces, women can self-refer every two years, depending on the province, either at age 40 or 50, and in B.C., women with a mother or sister with breast cancer can come every year. Women without a mother or sister with breast cancer can only come every two years. And what did I tell you about a family history? 75% of women have no family history. So that's, that, that doesn't mean you're at low risk. I'm going to share a secret with you. Everybody listen up. If you go for a screening mammogram, you will get a reminder letter two years later. I just told you it's better to get screened more often. If you want to be screened more often, here's the trick. You put it in your calendar to phone them 18 months later. If you phone it 18 months, they will let you book a mammogram. If you call it 17 months, they'll say, sorry, you can't come for two years. Don't wait for the letter. Put it in your calendar and go at 18 months. The task forces only use data from the randomized controlled trials to determine the benefits of screening. So they only considered mortality reduction because that's the only thing you can show in a randomized trial. But the other benefits of early detection that our task forces did not consider were the option for less aggressive surgery, the option for avoiding the armpit surgery, and the option to avoid chemo. Those are pretty big deals. And you can only do that when we find cancer early. I won't leave the next slide on very long. Some of you might find it upsetting. Why would you want an operation like this when you can have a lumpectomy after cancer and look like that? When Dr. Nick Perry left his position as director of the UK Central and East London Breast Screening Program in 2008, he opened a private clinic in London called the London Breast Institute, and it's a private clinic that offers screening for women who want to attend earlier or more often than they can get through the NHS. NHS only screens every three years for women 50 to 70. And soon after, he presented data at the big radiology meeting in Chicago, 
and he looked at the likelihood of mastectomy related to how recently a woman's last mammogram was done. For women whose last mammogram was in the previous year, only 22% of them needed a mastectomy, but for women whose mammogram was done more than a year before, more than half of them needed a mastectomy. And you can see that the mean size, the presence of more than one tumor, and the aggressiveness of the tumors in his study increased the further away they were from their last mammogram. And this is not shown in randomized trials. These researchers from New York showed that the other benefits of early detection um, accrue to women who have mammography more often. Women who have screening mammography less often are more likely to need chemo, have mastectomies, and require axillary dissection. So this is what lymphedema looks like. It's a swelling in the hand and arm, and it's a result of blockage of the lymphatic vessels in the armpit. It's a side effect of the traditional armpit surgery done as part of breast cancer lymph node staging. It's permanent, and as you can imagine, it is life-changing. It's arguably the worst part of breast cancer for many women. When cancer is detected early, women can have a sentinel node biopsy instead of the big armpit surgery with a much lower risk of lymphedema. So there's a benefit of having early cancer detection. Chemotherapy is awful, but unlike lymphedema, it's not forever. And now, with genomic testing of the actual tumor, many women can avoid chemo if their cancer is small and if they have no positive nodes. Another reason to find cancers early. And the task forces did not give this any weight in deciding that the harms outweigh the benefits. So what's the issue with breast density? Well, you're experts already. I showed you that white cancer. We are pretty good at recognizing cancer on a mammogram when we can see it. Here's an obvious cancer in a 55-year-old woman, and this is a close-up. You can see it has jaggedy edges, and if you know the lights, there's some little white dots here some of you might be able to see, and those are suspicious calcifications which were associated with her cancer. And it's relatively easier to see cancer when the breast is mainly fatty, like in this woman. Fat is dark gray on a mammogram, so a white cancer kind of jumps out at you like a star in the sky. But as the amount of dense tissue, which is this normal white stuff, increases relative fat, this is a normal mammogram. This is a normal mammogram. They're not like chest x-rays. They don't all look the same. Uh, the, as you get more and more dense tissue in the breast, it's harder to see cancer. It's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. And some women have almost no fat, and their breasts are totally dense. And so even a large cancer could be hiding in this dense breast tissue. We have known since the 1970s that having dense breast tissue is an independent risk for getting breast cancer. Dr. John Wolfe described four density patterns, and he found that women with dense breasts were at a much higher risk of getting cancer than women with fatty breasts. Radiologists still grade density into four categories, A, B, C, D. Some provinces use the quartile system, which is the North American standard, and the radiologist is, can subjectively decide, looking at the mammogram, what category the woman falls into. Less than 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100. The new system that we've been using since 2014 also takes a con into consideration how likely it is that a cancer could be masked. So for example, this lady doesn't have that much breast tissue, but she's, if she's unlucky enough that her cancer starts growing in there instead of out here, we might still miss it. Now some provinces only ask the radiologist to decide if the breast density is greater or less than 75%, but we're lucky in British Columbia that we use the four category system. And here's where, where it, it all comes home. This is an example of the masking effect. This is actually a friend of a friend of mine. And at age 50, this was her mammogram, and it was negative. She's got lots of dense tissue, and this really is a negative mammogram. But negative, if you have dense breasts, doesn't mean no cancer. Eight months later, she came back after finding a lump in her breast. And we took the pictures again. The technologist taped this little triangular marker on her skin so we know approximately where her lump is. We repeated the mammogram. We even did a 3D mammogram on her, and it was completely negative. But because she had a lump, we did an ultrasound, and her 3.2 centimeter cancer was easy to see. It had already spread to her lymph nodes. When a cancer is diagnosed after the most recent screening mammogram was negative, it's called an interval cancer because it occurs in the interval between planned screening mammograms. And interval cancers are 18 times more common 
in women with dense breasts than in fatty breasts, and we see cases like this every week. But here's the thing, dense breasts are normal, and they're common. Every woman has fat and glands and fibrous tissue in her breasts, but the proportions vary from woman to woman. That's that four category system. They're all normal, but they look different. Breasts that have more than 50% glands and fibrous tissue are called dense breasts, and more than 40% of women aged 40 to 74 have dense breasts. Sometimes uh, breast density can diminish as a woman get, gets older, but uh, not always. And so while it's normal to have dense breasts, women should know if they have dense breasts, and then they can understand the implications. In Canada, there are 3.4 million women over the age of 40 with dense breasts, and over 800,000, almost a million women, in the highest density category, that category D. And even though breast density can decrease with age, almost a third of women in their 60s still have dense breasts. So here's why it's important for you to know if you have dense breasts. Women in the D category are four to six, more uh, four to six times higher risk of getting breast cancer than women with fatty breasts. Plus, there's that masking effect because dense tissue and cancer both look white on the mammogram, so a cancer can be hidden in dense breast tissue. Cancers in dense breasts are found later, so they're more often larger, they're more often node positive, and they're, as I told you, eight times, 18 times higher the risk of an interval cancer. And those have a worse prognosis than cancers that we find at screening. Now here's something you might not figure out. Breast density can only be determined by a radiologist looking at the mammogram. You cannot tell by feel. You can't tell by size. Lumpy breasts are not the same as dense breasts. You can have lumpy feeling breasts that are fat. You can have smooth, non-lumpy breasts that are really dense. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. Some provinces, such as Nova Scotia and Alberta, are beginning to use software. So instead of the radiologist eyeballing the film and deciding what category the breast fits into, there's now software that does it. So how does ultrasound fit in? Well, for many years it was believed that ultrasound could not find cancers that weren't visible on mammography and were too small to feel. But we published this paper over 20 years ago and it was followed by work from multiple other institutions and then multi-centered trials that showed that high-resolution ultrasound can find cancers that are too small to be feelable, but they're missed on mammography, largely because of dense breast tissue. And this multi-centered trial found 5.3 cancers per thousand women screened in the first year, and average over three years, 4.3 cancers per thousand women that they screened. Now you might think, wait a minute, only three to four cancers per thousand women? That doesn't sound very impressive. Well, guess how many ma cancers we find doing mammograms? Four cancers, right? Remember those thousand women? And four of them out of the 11 with the needle biopsy. So we're finding four cancers with mammography, and then we're finding another four if we do ultrasound on the women with dense breasts. And the good thing was, of the cancers that they were finding on ultrasound, 94% of them were invasive. These are real cancers. They were small. The median size was 10 millimeters. And almost all of them were node negative. That's what you want to find, small, invasive, node negative cancers. Now, these women were offered MRI after the three years. Only 42% of the eligible women, uh, sorry, 42% declined the MRI. And then MRI found another 14.7 per thousand women, but these were higher risk women. Some of them even had the breast cancer gene. Ultrasound can be done with a handheld probe, which is what most of you are used to seeing if you've ever had in an ultrasound. But there are also now these automated probes called ABUS. And it's a big, huge thing that um, the technologist holds over the pa patient's breast and the scanner automatically goes back and forth inside. Any ordinary ultrasound machine can do breast ultrasound, but not all clinics offer it. And screening ultrasound is not yet covered by MSP. So if you have a lump in your breast, MSP covers the ultrasound, and they just target the area where the lump is. If you have a mass on your screening mammogram and we need to do an ultrasound, MSP covers it, and we look just at that area. But when a woman wants to be screened because she's got dense breasts and she wants top to bottom both breasts, that is not yet covered by MSP. Now, in spite of all the emerging evidence on breast density, it was still not being shared with women. Women were not being told, and in many cases, the information wasn't even told to their doctors. 
Nancy Capello is a PhD in educational leadership and she lives in Connecticut. In 2004, only weeks after her routine annual mammogram that was negative, she found a lump in her breast, just like the friend of the friend I showed you, and the ultrasound showed a cancer and she was diagnosed as a stage 3C with 13 positive lymph nodes. And she said to her doctor, wait a minute, I just had a negative mammogram. What are you telling me I have cancer? And they said, well, you have dense breasts and we know that we can miss cancers in dense breasts. And she said, whoa, you knew something about me that you didn't tell me and I might have been able to do something about it. And she started grassroots movement to get women notified when they have dense breasts. And since the medical establishment pushed her away, she went to legislators. And there are now 35 states in the U.S. with some degree of density notification. And in the past few weeks, we've had some wonderful news in Canada. Thanks to the efforts of a group called Dense Breast Canada, B.C. was the first province to announce that starting last month, October 15th, women are being informed of their breast density when they have a screening mammogram and several other provinces are considering it. So here you see how much of the U.S. is pink. Here's the map of Canada. B.C.'s the first. Now, Connecticut was the first state to legislate, so they've been ha they have the most data. They now have several years of uh, follow-up data, and they're finding, just as you saw in that other study, three to four cancers per thousand women, year after year after year. Now, when they first started, they were recommending a lot of biopsies because they didn't have that much experience, and only 7% of their biopsies turned out to be cancer. But with experience and with the availability now of prior years screening to compare with, their PPV, the number, the percentage of their biopsies that turn out to be cancer is 17%, which is pretty darn good. Here's some, some examples of, given to me by my colleague at Yale. And here you see these little cancers on ultrasound that were missed in these dense breasts. And these aren't screamingly dense breasts. This is this one might even be a B or borderline C. There's a C, there's a C. So we're finding cancers in dense breasts. Now your doctor may be unaware of all this stuff. Unaware of the greater risk of getting breast cancer when breasts are dense. Unaware that having dense breasts is a stronger risk factor than having a mother with breast cancer. Unaware of the greater likelihood of a cancer being missed on a mammogram when breasts are dense. In fact, 50% of cancers are missed on mammography in dense breast tissue. And your doctor's probably unaware of the ability to find cancers using ultrasound when they're missed on the mammogram. You may have heard of 3D mammography, also called tomosynthesis. It's a better mammogram than the standard 2D. It's not yet being used in any screening program in Canada, but we know that it finds about 30% more cancers than regular 2D mammograms, and it has fewer false alarms, which is even better. But it only sees about half as many of the cancers that are visible on ultrasound that are missed on dense breasts and mammography. So I want to show you how 3D works, and hope the hopefully the video will play. Um, here's that small picture of what a typical cancer looks like. And here's a woman with, I would say, a bi-red C-density breast. And there's a cancer in that breast. Can you see it? Put your hand up if you think you can see it. Good. <laughs> there's, the, there's your example to follow. And now watch. This is a moving picture. And I want you to focus here. This is where her cancer is. Can you see that? jumping out at you there. It's already, we're out of it there. So this is like scrolling through the breast. Here's a zoomed in picture of that same area. Does that not look, whoops, does that not look like the, uh, more like the uh, picture I showed you in the fatty breast? So 3D is displayed like a movie, and we read screening mammograms in batches, often 50 or more at a time. So anything that makes finding cancers early is valuable to me. And here's some examples of small cancers, again from Yale, that were seen on ultrasound that were missed, even on the 3D mammogram. So I'll just spend a couple minutes talking about other technologies that you, I'm sure you've heard of. MRI is the most sensitive test at finding breast cancer, but it's very expensive. It requires an intravenous injection and it has the most false alarms. So not all women can have MRI. And, and um, in BC, uh, MRI screening is limited to women who have one of the breast cancer genes. There's also some concern about using it for women who are not at very high risk of breast cancer because we don't know the long-term effect of the intravenous injection. And we know that some of that stuff gets deposited in the brain. 
There's a new way of doing breast MRI that's much faster. It's faster for, for the woman in the machine. The most common complaint is claustrophobia. People just cannot tolerate it. It's like being in a really narrow tube. And so this is a way of doing breast MR that's much faster. It's faster for the woman to get out of the machine, and it's even faster for the radiologist to read. It's called abbreviated MRI, or some people call it fast MRI. It's being studied now, and if they can bring down the cost, it might be used more often for women at higher than average or even average risk, but we're not there yet. Here's another test called Contrast Enhanced Dual Energy Mammography, and it's another test that shows promise. It shows almost as many cancers as MRI, but with fewer false uh, alarms. It requires an intravenous injection, but it uses a different substance that MRI uses, and it's much less costly. The only place in Canada doing this now is London, Ontario, but we're hoping to get it in, in BC. Uh, there's two different nuclear medicine tests that can find breast cancer. One's called molecular breast imaging, and the other's called breast-specific gamma imaging. Both of them require injection of a radioactive material, so the radiation dose is to the whole body. It's not just that low dose to the breast, like with a mammogram, because the stuff... The radioactivity is in your blood, it goes everywhere, and because it's excreted in the urine, it sits in the bladder for a while and it's radiating the ovaries, so it's not a good idea for younger women. Also, the effective dose from the injection is six times higher than uh, the dose for a mammogram. It's also not good at finding all the different types of breast cancer. So, how do you find out your breast density? Well, anybody who's had their screening mammogram after uh, October 15th would have received their des breast density category in the result letter. Now, so far, the letters don't actually say you have dense breasts or you don't have dense breasts. They say your category A, B, C, D. And you people in the room are one of the few in British Columbia that understand what that means now. Um, we're hoping they fix that. Uh, I, we didn't realize it was going to be like that when they announced it, but people started phoning, well, what does this mean? It says I'm a category D. Um, and if you've had your mammogram before October 15th and you want to know your density and you're not going to be due for a screening mammogram for a while, there is a request for information form that you can fill out and fax it or mail it to the BC Cancer Breast Screening Head Office, and they will mail you back the information about your breast density. You can find that form on this website, densebreastcanada.ca, and that's breast with an S on it, Dense Breasts Canada. So if you do have dense breasts, please continue having mammograms. They can detect cancer that we can't see on ultrasound. A lot of women say, well, why bother with the mammogram? Why don't I just have an ultrasound? No, uh, mammography still finds cancers that we miss on ultrasound. I would recommend that women with dense breasts ignore the Canadian Task Force guidelines and do breast self-examination. So if you do have dense breasts and we are unlucky and can't see your uh, cancer on a mammogram, you might be able to feel it smaller than when it's bigger. For women who are still having regular menstrual periods, they should do their breast self-exam after their period, just after their period stops, because most women's breasts are tender and lumpy, and the lumpiness is worse before the period. So you want to do your breast self-exam after your period. Also, you should consider improving your lifestyle to decrease breast cancer risk. And I've already told you how. Get to and stay at a healthy body weight. Do moderate exercise. Decrease alcohol intake. And keep your hormone use to a minimum. Now, you know, any, any drug, there's benefits and risks. If you need hormones for hot flashes and miserable sleep, you take them. But you take them for the lowest possible dose for the shortest possible period of time and wean off when you can. Speak to your doctor about your level of density, the associated risks, and any additional risk factors and the best screening options for you. To improve early cancer detection in dense breasts, some women want to consider additional screening like ultrasound or MRI, but remember, these are not covered by MSP. Now, they started telling women on it, October 15th uh, the breast density in the report letters, but they haven't yet implemented an educational program for GPs. The GPs are still thinking that the Canadian Task Force is the Bible and they shouldn't do breast exams and women shouldn't do breast self-exams. The Canadian Task Force also doesn't make a big deal of breast density. They say, yeah, oh well, yeah, whatever. So your GP might not know any of this stuff. And uh, our provincial screening program is just convening. They had their first meeting of a patient and a doctor education group. How should we educate patients? How should we educate doctors? So by even attending uh, this lecture, you're one step ahead. You sometimes see administrators propose that we should do mammograms only in women who are higher than average risk, but that doesn't work. 
I've told you, we're all at risk and getting older is the next risk factor. Dr. Alyssa Price showed that risk-based screening misses more than 75% of breast cancers. She looked at 136 cancers detected in women in their 40s at UCSF. Almost 90% of them had no strong family history and almost 90% didn't have extremely dense breasts. Of the 136 cancers, 50% were invasive, 91% were hormone receptor positive, that's good, that's a good prognosis, and 78% were no negative. So these were mainly good prognosis cancers. Researchers in the UK looked at what would happen if they screened less often in women who they thought were at lower risk. They were thrilled to say that the level of overdiagnosis decreased and that they saved money, but if you read the fine print, 10% more women would die. And I, that's not okay. So here's what I want you to remember from all that information. All women should have mammograms, ideally starting at 40 and as close to annually as you can swing it. Remember, phone them at 18 months and make that next appointment. In BC, the reminder letter is not coming to you for two years, but call it 18 months. Some cancers are not detectable on mammograms, so it's worth doing breast self-examination. You have to get to know what your normal feels like so that you'll know if there's a change. Lots of women say, oh, I don't like doing it because I feel all these lumps everywhere. Well, make friends with them. Okay, that's your normal. You're looking for different from your normal, and you'll only recognize different if you know what your normal is. Women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer. And most abnormalities that we see on mammograms are not cancer. So don't panic if you get recalled from a screening mammogram. And when you look at the real numbers for mortality reduction and the other benefits of early detection, I feel very strongly that the, bene the, the um, benefits outweigh the harms. Ultrasound does find cancer that's missed on mammograms and dense breasts, even by using 3D mammography. And remember that having dense breasts imposes two risks. They increase the risk of getting cancer in the first place, and there's a risk that we won't see it on your mammogram. They reduce the accuracy of mammography. It's important to know your breast density and understand those implications. So please speak to your family doctor about your risk factors. And for more on information on breast density, look for Dense Breast Canada online, on Facebook, and on Twitter. And this is an excellent website uh, based on all evidence-based uh, journal articles, densebreastsingular-info.org. And full disclosure, I'm a volunteer advisor to both of these groups. And thanks for your attention. So... Now, I can't see you, but there, we do have time for questions. Yes, we have time for questions. And um, where are those? I'm a terrible pitcher. I'm supposed to, as soon as I can see somebody put their hand up. Yeah. Do you want to throw? No, no. I throw like a girl. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any, any questions? That was, yes. Hi, I was just wondering um, how this changes or does it change for women who have breast augmentation or breast reductions? Um, no, um, you, can, you can still have dense tissue after either. The, the one difference is that if a woman has breast implants, she can't attend the screening program. Women who have uh, breast implants uh, require much longer time to do their mammogram because we do the picture with the implant and then we push the implant out of the way and we get better compression on the breast tissue itself. So we take twice as many pictures, takes twice as long to do the mammogram and that doesn't fit in the screening schedule because screening is in and out, in and out. Women who've had a reduction can have a routine screening mammogram. But here's something to consider. If a woman's considering either augmentation or reduction, we want her to have a screening mammogram before the surgery. You'd be amazed at how many little cancers we find it's like, wait a minute, don't get those implants yet. We've got to treat your cancer. Question. Going once. Yes. Oh, wow. So it didn't, it didn't 
didn't work for me, but for those people, it's a really good thing. That's so generous of you. So we need women in other provinces. like the, So the dense breast ladies, I call them, the founders, one's in Toronto, one's in uh, Burnaby, here. And um, each of them found out about their dense breasts and found out about Nancy Capello. And they got in touch with her and they said, what can we do? And she said, first of all, you two should be speaking to each other and you should both speak to Paula. But So it's been fabulous in BC. And I've given lectures in other provinces, but we don't have the advocates. We need patient advocates. So if anybody knows anybody in other provinces who will speak up, that's what it's going to take. I keep saying, nobody's listening to me. You know, I'm perceived as having a conflict of interest. Oh, you only want to do those ultrasounds so you can earn more money. It's when women speak up, when voters speak up. And that's why Nancy went to legislators, and I'm going around to MPs and MLAs and whoever will listen to me. So thank you for your generosity. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, you only go to age 74. Are you saying that after 74 you don't have to have Great families? question. So um, women can still come for screening, and they should if they're in good health. Our screening program decided, it used to be 79, now they made it 74, that at that age they would like a requisition from a doctor. So if a woman's in good health and she have a, has a life expectancy of at least 5 to 10 years, Please come. If you've already got end-stage kidney disease, we don't need to find a cancer that's going to take five years to show itself. They're going to likely to die before that. But when we find small cancer, I, I do needle biopsies on 90-year-olds, and I make sure that they're, you know, they're, they're young 90s, they can take that out with local anesthetic. If you leave a cancer in there and it grows, it can erode through the skin, it's wet and messy and smelly, and it's a nursing nightmare. Take it out with a little local and then it's gone and maybe give her some tamoxifen, which is the anti-estrogen drug when a cancer is hormone positive. So it's absolutely worth continuing screening. It's just at that point, they kind of want the GP to be the gatekeeper and say, yeah, she's healthy. Yes. Just real So the question was, is there data about an increase of uh, men with breast cancer? About 1% of all breast cancers occur in men, but they're, they've, they're uncommon. So we don't screen for them, except men who have the BRCA gene, we can screen them. But um, typically the presentation is a man comes in and he's got a lump. And most men with lumps don't have cancer. They have something called gynecomastia. But we do diagnose breast cancer in men. And some men, because they it's not like... It's not in their mind that that could ever happen. They sometimes even present later than women. Yes. Hi. Um, so just this year, my father has had breast cancer and treated and, and all of that. So, um, and I know that they say exactly what you said. Um, you're, you're, you, if you have family history in your mother or or the or father maternal side. Oh, it's so father. Or father now. So if a man gets breast cancer. What might be a good idea is for him to get tested for the breast cancer gene. Because if he's got it, he could pass it on to his children. Now, in, typically in BC, they, it, in that kind of situation, a woman says, my dad had breast cancer. Can I have the test for the gene? They won't test you. They want to test him because he's, if he's negative, you can't have it. Right? So they're starting with the person who has the breast cancer. And it gets really difficult if a woman says, well, my mother and, her, and my two sisters have died of breast cancer. They're both gone. It's a bit tricky. Sometimes they put up a fuss and don't want to test the woman. I hope that's loosening up a little bit. But there's a special hereditary cancer program at the BC Cancer Agency. And um, in the case of a dad with breast cancer, I would get him to ask his doctor if he can have the test. And secondly, just for clarification on the density. So as, as you age, density goes down. It can. So someone going through uh, their, their biannual or, or annual mammogram, they can somewhat um, they can diminish, predict yep. that their, their density will decrease over time. You can't time. predict for a given woman. Okay. You just have to see. And there is some variability because when we don't use software, um, and I'm just eyeballing it and saying, okay, she's a C. 
Um, what I do is I always look at what my previous person said, and it's I know which of my colleagues always grade higher than I do. Um, but um, sometimes I'll say, okay, this one I'm kind of on the fence. It's between a B and a C. And I'll look, and she called it a D? Like, that's really strange for me that it's that. But that's how variable it can be. So if you get a different num uh, different category from year to year, sometimes it's real, but sometimes it's, it's just the radiologist. I mean, even myself, if I look at you one year and the next year, I might just want to call you a different number. But that's why I typically flip back and look at the previous one. Um, but you saw on that slide that 30% um, of women in their 60s still have dense breasts. So you don't know until you have the mammogram whether you got less dense or not. If you, for example, women who take tamoxifen, which is the anti-estrogen drug, their density can diminish. A woman goes through menopause and she's miserable with menopausal symptoms and she goes on hormones, her breast density can increase. Thanks. Any more? Thank you. You've been great. i really impressed you stayed awake right after lunch and with the lights off.